Okay, so welcome to the HPC Best Practices uh, webinar series. The series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project, with, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. The, ser the series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities of the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. Uh, I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge, and I will be the hosts for today's webinar. Reducing technical debt with reproducible containers, and the webinar will be presented by Tanu Malik. Uh, Tanu is an assistant professor in the School of Computing at DePaul University, where she directs the data systems and, and optimization lab. Her research interests span topics in data provenance, data systems, distributed systems, and cyber infrastructure for scientific data management. She received in computer science from the John Hopkins University and uh, a National Science Foundation Career Award for her work on computational reproducibility. She's also a 2000, uh, 2019 Better Scientific Software Fellow, as indicated in this slide you see. Uh, we have issued uh, uh, more than 107 tickets for this webinar, and all attendees have been muted uh, by default. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc, we have pasted these uh, uh, addresses in the, in the Zoom chat. And the webinar will have a break, is, break so the speaker can respond to the questions that came in. With that, Tanu, I'll stop my uh, sharing here and you please take over. Uh, thank you, Osni. <clears throat> Let me share my screen. Rosny, you can see my screen, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rosny, uh, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Uh, thanks so much for taking time out and tuning into, into this webinar. Uh, Osni provided a little bit of introduction. Um, uh, let me just expand a little bit on that. Uh, my research experience and expertise is in databases and distributed computing. Uh, I, for the past eight to nine years, I've been working on data provenance and more recently in using provenance for establishing computational reproducibility. Uh, I'm working on developing uh, a system for efficient reproducible analysis. It's called SciUnit, can be accessible through this website, uh, SciUnit.run. Uh, and as part of the BSSW fellowship, uh, I am very interested in reproducibility case studies in the high performance computing area, and especially how containers can be used for uh, establishing reproducibility. Um, I'm working on some problems these days, which is provenance alignment, uh, trying to highlight sources of irreproducibility using provenance traces, uh, and also determining how I can make Jupyter notebooks reproducible, which we all know they aren't. Uh, <clears throat> so that is about me, and, and today I am uh, going to talk about uh, the deducing technical debt with the producible uh, containers. Uh, so let me demystify some of the words uh, over here uh, and this give a little outline uh, for this talk. Uh, so first we are going to understand uh, how technical debt uh, impacts reproducibility uh, and can we measure it. Uh, and in the second part of the talk, uh, I'll be exploring this concept of reproducible uh, containers and if they provide a mechanism uh, to formally uh, addressing the, the enormous uh, problem. Uh, and finally, a guidance and, and, and summary. <clears throat> So part one, uh, how technical debt affects uh, reproducibility. <clears throat> so we are all uh, familiar with uh, monetary debt, uh, especially on commodities such as the house, the car, the credit card. Uh, what is monetary debt? It is something that we are borrowing, a fixed amount of money that we are borrowing uh, to purchase these, these commodities. <clears throat> Now, what does borrowing help us? Well, it helps us get this commodity uh, faster or, or sooner, right? And so we like this, the, this fact uh, uh, that we can get this commodity sooner. 
Now, technical debt, uh, which was introduced by Ward Cunningham in 1992, uh, is no different. Uh, in science, the commodity is our scientific publication. Uh, and how do I get that publication faster or sooner? Well, one may say by being smart or putting in a lot of hard work, uh, but increasingly by also borrowing uh, from the scientific software that produces uh, the publication. Uh, more publications, more borrowing, uh, maybe not on the same software, but the overall research direction that a person is, is uh, pursuing. Uh, and that results in, uh, you know, as the time goes, we are, we are borrowing from the, and I'll describe what I mean by borrowing, but we are borrowing from uh, the software uh, uh, for each particular journal deadline, uh, resulting in technical uh, debt. <clears throat> and in, in some senses, it's a resulting in an overall poor scientific and research software that can be coming out from a given research group or a lab group. So what are we borrowing on? Uh, well, we borrow on the uh, quality of code, the design, uh, environment debt, not keeping track of the environment, or documenting, uh, or writing tests. These are dimensions of technical debt uh, which are known, known to us. Now, going back to our analogy, if we do not repay our debt in, in any way, uh, what happens to our commodity is that it is reprocessed. So what should happen for a publication on which the technical debt that has been borrowed uh, from the scientific software is not repaid? Well, increasingly, uh, it is going to be marked irreproducible, uh, which we know that if such a badge is given to a publication, it impacts citations and it impacts reputation. So we, so people do want to avoid uh, this, this badge. So let's go back to our dimensions of uh, the, the technical debt uh, and see that what we can do to address so that we do not get such badges. Uh, now this, as we can see, the, the characterization of the technical debt, such as poor quality, poor design, these are larger software engineering uh, issues. Uh, and I won't be going much into them uh, because they, they are actually very well referenced in the citation over here, uh, but they do not impact uh, uh, reproducibility as such. Uh, so quality of design, uh, poor quality of the code design or testing debt. I'm going to focus on environment debt uh, and documentation debt because these are two things that are immediately responsible for uh, reproducibility. <clears throat> Okay, so this is, this is the technical debt that I'm going to focus on, as, uh, the environment debt and, and the documentation debt. Uh, but let's define, uh, you know, reproducibility. What, what do we mean by, by reproducibility? <clears throat> and specifically computational uh, reproducibility. So in this reproducibility, I'm not referring to bugs in software. Uh, we know that some of these bugs have led to catastrophes, and, uh, but we are really concerned with this common case of, of irreproducibility. Uh, such as when claims in publications cannot be verified through available uh, software. Uh, and in the worst case, they must be retracted, uh, retracted back. Or when quick software evaluation is essential, uh, to trust the experiments, which are being obviously being uh, published in, in papers, such as an example over here that we are facing the pandemic. There's a software which we know is uh, requires testing so that we can do our projections, the model projections uh, correctly. Uh, in particular, let's relate these technical debt and reproducibility at uh, a conference which is closer to home, uh, the Supercomputing 2020, which is about to be uh, held. 
so let's look at what is technical debt and what is reproducibility at, what does it mean? Uh, I think we'll be better able to appreciate these two concepts rather than in a very abstract uh, sense. <clears throat> so I was the artifact evaluation and description program committee member. Uh, this was done as part of the Transparency and Reproducibility Initiative in Supercomputing uh, 2020. Um, the idea is in artifact description and evaluation is that any paper that gets submitted uh, must include an appendix with detailed artifact description uh, of the environments and methodologies uh, that were used to uh, publish the, the key results in the paper. Uh, so when the authors submit these artifacts, uh, the review process not only looks at the PDF document, it also looks at uh, the artifacts that are being submitted. Uh, and the final rating for a paper is a combination of uh, the technical review and the artifact uh, review. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, did technical debt affect reproducibility of, of claims? Uh, let's see some, uh, some results in, in, this, in this regard. <clears throat> so supercomputing had, uh, as we can see at the bottom, uh, 380 submissions. Uh, and each reviewer, uh, like, like a person like me, got about 80 submissions to review. Yeah, a lot of submissions to review. Uh, in, and, and supercomputing had two phases uh, for reviewing. In phase one, uh, 75, as you can see, uh, I have five over here, 75 basically got a rating of good and below. Uh, and anything reviewed as good was considered, or anything reviewed as good or below was considered unacceptable for submissions. So in the very first phase, uh, authors have not submitted even the relevant artifacts for, for their paper. Uh, after revision in, the, in phase two, 43 of them got approved uh, for, based on their technical review and their artifact review uh, for proceeding to phase two. And after phase two, uh, 24 of them got a rating of, uh, of very good and excellent uh, from me. Uh, uh, and the remaining of them, which is 17 of them, uh, did not qualify. So that was a combination of technical review and ADNA uh, description review. Uh, one paper was considered unacceptable uh, for artifact description and evaluation. Uh, and, and one of them was pushed for its excellent research idea, but it was considered uh, unacceptable for artifact description and evaluation. Uh, in total, uh, uh, out of the 380 submissions, I'm told that 17 uh, may be badged uh, for, that is a final stamp of reproducibility will only be given to 17 of the 380 uh, uh, submitted uh, submissions. <clears throat> so what does this, uh, say about the technical debt and reproducibility? What does this, this, th these, these numbers say? Uh, clearly, uh, for most authors, in my experience, uh, the, the reproducibility is an afterthought. Um, and as, as you could see that after saying that a paper would not be accepted, which is like a stick, uh, authors who had not taken this process seriously do submit. Uh, but when, even when they submit their artifacts, a big problem is uh, identifying the files for an application. What are those files? Uh, they would uh, def miss, in many cases, they would miss what exactly consists of an application. They would lose out the data pre-processing steps. Uh, how was the data acquired? Uh, and you know, how would the find this, this particular program lead to the result which is published in, in the paper? So the entire workflow is, is, is not there, even though uh, some of the programs would have been submitted, a Zenodo a directory would have been created, a GitHub repository would, would have been uh, created. <clears throat> uh, 
so clearly, this is a time-consuming task. It did not happen in the phase one, as we are seeing. Uh, very few authors could submit it. And even in phase two, it was a hard thing to, to get them to submit the complete workflow. Uh, and there was no mapping of experiments to to content uh, in the paper, and and I would say it was uh, not even that super as a conference itself did not have the infrastructure to establish the the uh, the verification of the final claims, and, and that is something that that should be done. <laughs> So I hope to have a better quantification of technical debt. This is the preliminary result as, as I uh, intend to co-chair ADA for next year's uh, SC. Uh, but it brings us in this particular talk uh, to talk about, uh, is there a way by which we can reduce this author burden and the reviewer burden? Uh, and I want to talk about uh, reproducible containers if they can, in some say, some ways, as I say, provide a formal start uh, in addressing this this reproducibility problem. <clears throat> So we have a reproducibility ecosystem of tools, uh, such as Zenodo, GitHub, uh, Package Managers, Figshare. They enable us to share data, share code. Um, and we have also heard of uh, the cloud uh, sharing images, an entire virtual machine. We can share virtual machines on AWS or Azure. Uh, I want to specifically focus on Docker. Uh, as a container system, it has become very popular for doing a reproducible uh, research. <clears throat> So what do uh, containers do? They provide a complete tool chain uh, to simplify the use of containers. Uh, we can build containers, we can run containers, ship them, uh, share them. Uh, and this, ex this BSSW itself, this idea series had an excellent talk uh, a few weeks back uh, on introducing uh, containers uh, over here. <clears throat> Uh, and just to be for the real uh, people, who, for people who are not very aware of what containers do, containers uh, use namespaces. They will isolate uh, everything in an application. Uh, so if an application, for instance, here uh, uh, using Tomcat, Java, and, and Debian, uh, uh, distribution uh, has to be run, then this application can run in isolation without interacting with the operating system uh, kernel over here. Again, this container in green over here can operate in isolation without interacting with the operating system kernel or any other container over here. So in this way, a container behaves like a VM, uh, a virtual machine, but is very much lightweight. Uh, it's not use including the operating system. Uh, in addition, the containers can uh, um, uh, proportion the, the resources that are availab available to them, such as a CPU memory. So for instance, the yellow container over here can use 20% of the CPU, a uh, little bit of the file system uh, as much as uh, is allocated, and some uh, portion of the, of the network bandwidth. Uh, and similarly, green can be allocated. So this is done through C groups. <clears throat> But most with everything with Docker containers, uh, as we saw a little bit going back over here, you start with a Docker file over here. So the, the very first phase of building a container starts with a, a, a Docker file. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, this Docker file must be programmed. And as some samples uh, show over here where we are trying to build the applications, these can be pretty complex like a regular program. So now let's think about, uh, you know, from a reproducibility perspective, uh, it seems something paradoxical over here. If another software system must be programmed to achieve reproducibility, uh, the question is, uh, does Docker solve or create further uh, technical debt? The technical debt that we have learned is when the user does not document the dependencies. Uh, and here we are aiming to achieve reproducibility by asking the same environment debt in the form of another program from uh, the author. So it's, it's, it's to say that it is solving the reproducibility debt is only after you have learned uh, what Docker does. <clears throat> so here is my claim. 
uh, that declarative encapsulation of dependencies for isolated execution does not reduce technical debt. In other words, the containers in their current form uh, do not reduce uh, technical uh, debt. The user must provide a complete description of uh, what is uh, required for an application to be able to even instantiate a, a container. <clears throat> So that brings us uh, to uh, uh, part to to further details of what uh, a reproducible container can look like. Well, the very first thing it can do is uh, automatic encapsulation of dependencies. And here I'm going to be uh, going a little bit more into the details of the SI unit uh, system, uh, which which does this this uh, automatic encapsulation of dependencies. <laughs> So the key idea in, in SciUnit is to identify dependencies during the program execution. So when your application is executing, it is accessing these dependencies. So why, don't, why not at that very time uh, copy them into, into some container-like uh, environment? <clears throat> so SciUnit captures application dependencies during executions. Uh, and it also repeats executions uh, within isolated environments with some guarantees. <clears throat> so why a guarantee? Uh, well, if you look, go back to our Docker container example, a Docker file may change. And thus, if, if it changes, its execution also changes. Uh, if we have, uh, if we need a reproducible container, it must provide some guarantee that how close is a reviewer's execution to author's execution. So we need to map those, that those executions are, are, are exactly the same. So going a little bit into how SciUnit works, to capture or audit, SciUnit uses ptrace uh, to observe the dependencies and environment variables. Uh, and it identifies binaries, libraries, scripts, and all the variables that the application is dependent upon. Uh, and these dependencies, which is a, it is observing during runtime, uh, are copied into a, a directory in the file system. Uh, so this is the host file system where uh, the application is, is, is running. Uh, inclusion of data files is optional. A user may or may not want to package based on the size of the data set. But I'll talk a little bit more in, in as, as, we, as we go along in this talk. <clears throat> So if you look at uh, the SciUnit file system slice, here we have an, ex uh, an, an, an example over here. Uh, I have a, 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 a weather sim.py, a Python program, which is accessing, which is, um, uh, is, is inputting a file tokyo.dat, which is using that file. And obviously, since I'm going to be running, running it with Python, uh, this, this file when it will this process that that will get instantiated depends on the python interpreter which may depend on further libraries so all of these are copied into uh, the the package the reproducibility package and its access log is also created over here with reads and writes uh, leading to a provenance graph <laughs> Uh, now, this created SciUnit log that I have uh, uh, is uh, can, and looking at it's how its actual graph is, we can identify what are the inputs, what are the outputs for an application. Uh, we can distinguish what are the system dependencies, what are the processes, uh, and from that, uh, we can, and querying the, the repository packages that are there, the, the, the package repositories, we can create a Docker file for that given application automatically. <clears throat> and, and any content which was specific to the application uh, can be identified that this is user content. This is not standardized uh, system binaries that are available and they can be copied directly into the, into the container. Now, if you have created this, automatically created this container, one can repeat it. Uh, it can be repeated uh, by providing some guarantee, in which case uh, the, the repetition takes place in namespace isolation. Uh, and each call is redirected 
within the package. So when uh, this, this entire package is working in isolation, uh, but for instance, when the user uh, tries to access slash user or slash tries to access uh, a given uh, dependency over here, well, it would be directed, redirected back into, into that file system slice that we created. <clears throat> um, now, uh, you know, how exactly do we do the matching uh, between the two logs of the audit and the repeat? Uh, you know, we, we provide some guarantees that whether the, the execution is exactly the same. Uh, we use Merkle trees and these provenance logs, uh, but I will not go into, into detail uh, uh, on them. <laughs> so uh, to come back, uh, SciUnit uh, takes three steps. Uh, to create a SI unit. When you are creating, it's independent of any programming languages. These are uh, all the various kinds of programming languages with which we have tested with. Um, you uh, share it, and currently it can be shared on Figshare uh, and HydroShare, which is popularly used by, by geoscientists. Uh, and then the, once you have the package, you can repeat it on any of, a, any of the cloud environments or, or research cloud environments. Uh, the current limitation is that uh, you can repeat it on, on any Linux machine, not Mac OS X or, or Windows. Um, any Linux distribution, uh, any Linux machine with a kernel distribution uh, in which glibc is greater than 2.17 and Python should be greater than uh, 2.7, which is standard in, in basically standard in, in all, all environments. Uh, so, so, so that in some senses enforces the reproducibility. We have to ensure the reproducibility of SI unit itself. Uh, and, and by reducing our, our dependencies over there, uh, we, we ensure, ensure that. Now, in high performance computing, we need network enabled SI unit, uh, a network enabled SI unit traces the application uh, on the leader node uh, and each of the follower nodes, and it audits both content and, and messages. Uh, and that's a lot, but yeah, it, it audits both content and messages, uh, and uh, which are, uh, you know, executed between the, between the, uh, the master node and the, the leader node and the follower node. <clears throat> Uh, and currently, the, the audits are merged uh, uh, manually. Uh, ma I, what I mean is that the audit, which is on each independent nodes, is brought to the leader node, uh, where we merge the, the network exchanges between the, uh, between the so, so the step of just bringing the, the audited content is, is manual. Um, now, uh, one may think about that, uh, you know, how does SciUnit differ from recording of messages in MPI applications and the deterministic replay uh, that systems like REMPI do? Uh, so here, again, as I mentioned, the, the SciUnit records messages, but also contents. And, and, and that is really important if you want to do reproducibility of applications uh, on, on different machines. And machines may differ because of, of heterogeneity, the, the specific libraries that they are using. <clears throat> uh, when you repeat, there are two execution modes. You can repeat in an offline mode. So uh, uh, the idea is that it might not be possible for a person to have the same setup. So you can just repeat it exactly in, 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 in an offline mode at one single node uh, without having any connection to, to other nodes. Uh, or um, uh, in when you have exactly same number of, of nodes, in which case SI unit needs to be configured uh, for the host names and IP addresses. <laughs> so that is uh, a, a SI unit. Let's look at uh, how SI unit behaves on uh, some, some of the programs that we have tested. So these are real applications. Uh, the first one, FIE, is a food inspection evaluation. Uh, it's a data mining uh, 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 data science, I would say, application which uses random forests to predict where food violations would be uh, would would be happening. Uh, variable infiltration capacity (VIC) over here uh, is a compute is is a data preprocessing pipeline for a for a computational hydrology computational model. Uh, and uh, intermittent query uh, engine over here is a database application, which is using uh, a Python application and SQL Lite, which is embedded in, in Python uh, 3, uh, to do uh, database style query uh, in, in, the, in the Python application. <clears throat> so as you can see, the source code uh, 
uh, languages are, are, are of a variety over here. The applications are of modest sizes uh, uh, with some runtime. And these are analysis applications, which uh, a user might be doing with, with a lot of, with, with some data. Uh, <clears throat> So let's look at uh, the uh, difference between Psi unit and, and, and Docker. Uh, so for the very first thing, let's look at the sizes of, of Psi unit and Docker. Uh, so the first uh, bar over here is the application size. Um, for uh, IQE and FIE, as you can see, it's 306 megabytes, uh, something 1.2 uh, gigabytes over here uh, for WIC. Uh, and as we can see, the Docker sizes uh, are, are fair fairly large, uh, about eight to ten, uh, eight to nine times larger than the application. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I would say uh, is is how so the 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 Docker sizes are almost double. In, in this particular case, is almost double, and over here, as we can see, is is about eight to nine times in case of FIE, about eight to nine times uh, larger. But as you see, the Psi unit size is, is much smaller. Um, now, Psi unit internally uses block level deduplication, uh, which makes Psi unit size even lower than the original application. So if you look at the middle bar over here, it's lower. And so it's identifying du uh, duplicate data at the block level, uh, even within an within application. So, uh, so the Psi unit sizes are much smaller because it is only including the necessary and sufficient files for an, for an application. So if you're running an application which does not need uh, the base images or, or any such other uh, paraphernalia of a Docker container, well, SciUnit is a lot more efficient uh, to use than, than a Docker container. Uh, what about uh, execution and uh, re-execution? Uh, so the normal run times for uh, an application like IQE is very small, like five seconds. For FIE, it's a, uh, as I said, is a uh, is a data science application running a random forest. Uh, it's uh, it's fairly two eighty seven seconds. For VIC, it's uh, data intensive but not compute intensive. So it's it's uh, about forty seconds. Uh, so for here, we are including the Docker build time, because you'll have to download the container as a one time event, but you'll have to download it. And that time is, is sufficient, is, 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 is a lot over here. So 191 seconds is the Docker build time uh, that, that I have over here. Uh, 1235 is, is uh, the uh, about 1200 seconds to just build this, this Docker container. Um, but if you look at the Psi unit times uh, uh, are fairly close to the application uh, normal runtime. A um, little bit overhead that we are seeing is because of intercepting and as well as copying the data. So audit time is more than the execution time, uh, but execution times are very close to uh, audit to the normal run times. Uh, the Docker build time, uh, sorry, the Docker execution time, we are seeing uh, increase in that. And that is coming not because of the execution of the application, but because uh, we have a, a layering of the file system. And because of the layering of the file system, uh, especially in case of FI, E, which is which is doing the running this random forest on a large number of city of Chicago data sets. Uh, uh, there is um, because of the layering, we are having a little overhead uh, in 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 FIE. Um, what about the network uh, execution? Uh, uh, the the network enabled Psi unit. Um, <coughs> So we, we ran it, uh, the, the results are not on a very large science use case that we have, but we have run it on a NASA parallel benchmark with class A applications and class B, each of which are uh, uh, exchanging uh, a, a modest amount of data, uh, like a, a very a small amount of data, 524 kilobytes and 268 kilobytes. So we have just a three machine uh, set up right now. Uh, and, um, uh, the idea is that they are pretty much compute intensive. We are trying to determine what is the uh, um, just the heterogeneity of the machines and can we capture everything from from the machines. Uh, and as we can see, the normal execution time uh, there is a about two point one percent overhead for uh, for for. Uh, 
auditing the content as well as the uh, the logs um, sorry auditing the the logs uh, is 2.1 percent overhead uh, which is including the network messages that we are uh, that we are logging uh, but the content audit obviously is larger because we have to now copy the files so about 5.3 percent uh, overhead over here um, uh, so for the for the uh, the specific class b over here uh, that we have uh, the overheads actually reduced for the metadata audit as well as for the content uh, audit but again the amount of data that is being exchanged is also uh, smaller um, WIC, which can also be run in a parallel mode uh, we have uh, tried to look at uh, you know the amount of content overhead for a real application does go uh, significantly and one can look into how one can avoid copying some of the messages uh, some of the the content which might be already be present uh, such as in an mpi application it would be the same program uh, that would be running at multiple nodes and and one doesn't need to audit them again and again um, so that is, those are the performance results of, of SciUnit. Um, here is a slide for the sample interaction with, with SciUnit, which is very Git-like. Uh, so uh, here I am creating uh, a SciUnit, just like you open a Git repo. Uh, you might have an application. This is the start point of the application. Uh, is inputting some parameters, such as a data set. Uh, and all you need to do is SciUnit exec. Uh, and um, and then you would do a sci unit list. So you're you're actually auditing the application while it is executing. As we can see, you can list whatever you have the packages that you have created. Uh, you can show details about them uh, over here, uh, and you can uh, push them onto some other host machine. For instance, this could be running on Alice's computer, and Bob might want to use it. So once you push it, uh, well, you it will be stored temporarily on our cloud server. Uh, you'll get a hash uh, ID, and then on the other machine, you can just open uh, with that with that hash ID, uh, and then just list your your sci unit. Repeat the execution. This is the first execution that is there, or you may change the execution. You may say that well, I want to run with a different data set uh, instead of uh, my 2017 data set. I want to run it with 2018 data set. Uh, run it, and then you know you'll have two executions that would have been captured. Uh, again, a sci unit is using deduplication inside, so it is not that the FIE application is being captured twice it's only being captured once so uh, I spoke about uh, you know this automatically creating this reproducible container to reduce the technical debt uh, but what about data right so we have lots of data right now the way I showed you all the data is captured so it's a binary sort of decision that you either include all the data or you do not include uh, <clears throat> But can we do better? Can we actually have a reproducible container which is only using the necessary and sufficient amount of data that an application uh, uses? <clears throat> so we consider this term debloating uh, the uh, container. Uh, Sorry. Is it a good time for questions or we have some questions here? Or would you... oh, sure. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, I'll, I, I, anytime, yes. Okay, before you get into this. Yes. So um, going back some slides, on your description of tested languages, mm -hmm. I noticed that CUDA wasn't present. Does this work with CUDA compiled, PyTorch, TensorFlow, etc.? cetera? Um, so with CUDA, audit happens, uh, repeat, uh, you, you can repeat in a Docker container, but audit will happen you would have uh, all the necessary dependencies. Uh, repeat, as I'm saying, that we are guaranteeing the specific repeat that requires us to look into the system call architecture of GPUs. Uh, not all the system calls that we support right now are being mapped into the GPU system call uh, architecture. OK, another question here. Uh, who pays down the technical debt of the site unit system itself? Uh, well, we are taking the, the debt for, uh, uh, thankfully, NSF has been funding us, so we are taking the technical debt of, of SciUnit uh, system and uh, keeping it up to date so that it can support multiple environments. 
So another one here, you know, does Psi unit work similarly with the, with the singularity? Yes. All right, so and then a final one, I think, is for, for, for now, is there a Psi unit to Docker converter? I would imagine for wider deployment, that might be useful. Yes. Uh, this over here, uh, and uh, you know, you would. We we recently published this paper about a Psi unit to Docker. Uh, so we have tested this on uh, about forty Zenodo projects. Um, we haven't publicly, uh, uh, like you know, widely released it. Uh, there is still more testing that is required uh, for different. As you said, we, as as we said, we support a variety of programming languages over here. Um, we have to test it for that uh, is our docker docker component also it's it's very much in demand uh, i must say uh, and before really uh, we haven't publicly released it for that very reason okay please continue then uh, then we that's all we we have for you okay so thank you osni uh, and thank you for the questions uh, so um, uh, so let's let's go to the second topic about uh, uh, is it possible to reduce the container size, uh, which is should we include data in it or or not? Um, and so we are looking into this concept of that the container, uh, for especially for a reproducibility perspective, uh, may may not need to include uh, data which was thought that the application would be using, but maybe the application does not use it. So if the application does not use it, the container is being unnecessarily being, uh, you know, fattened or bloated, uh, and we can figure out whether, uh, you know, uh, what is the necessary amount of data that is required for that container. <clears throat> Uh, so let's say we have, uh, just to motivate this idea, let's say we have a simple program uh, that opens this file over here, test.txt, uh, and it is uh, seeking to byte position 100, uh, and it is reading a C number of, uh, of bytes. Uh, and let's say this program was run uh, such that it uh, every time it is run, it is reading uh, from 100 to 150 or 100 to 190. So we have this information uh, that these are the possible executions of, of this application. So now the question becomes that should we include test.txt or should we uh, include just test.txt from offset 100 to 100, uh, 450? I mean, technically one should only be including uh, 100 to 100 uh, 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 you know, looking at the specific ranges exactly where it is reading. But here, as we can see that we don't know and we, we might just include 100, 200, uh, 2, 2, 450. <clears throat> because that is what the application uses. So MIDAS is that tool minimizing data sets. Uh, it is identifying, automatically identifying and including uh, only the relevant data chunks uh, and mapping these high level user inputs to, uh, to file offsets. So how does it do it? It uses partial evaluation, uh, which is an optimized compiler optimization technique to prune, prune code bases. Um, and, and partial evaluation typically uses uh, static inputs to generate a, a, a specialized uh, version of the program that only accepts dynamic uh, inputs. So let's look at a very quick example over here. So for instance, we had this, this program, uh, which is computing this function, compute opposite. Uh, and compute opposite, as we can see, is taking an input float angle and one is computing the tan of the angle um, input of the function. So, so the tan function would require the math library to be included as part of this container. Now, if I look at the program, the value of that, that would be passed to this function, which is angle, is already present over here, which is pi by four. Uh, so what uh, the specialization through partial evaluation does is, is it identifies that the red thing or the flow viewing angle is a static input uh, and it 
creates a specialized code where the value of the, the tan of angle is, is already present. So you don't need now the math library. Uh, and so your, your code base is, is essentially pruned. <clears throat> so we are adapting this idea to, to IO specialization. Uh, and the idea is to, uh, again, instrument your code and find what particular data chunks I need to extract uh, and either include them with the binary or have a little database which can uh, include this these set of chunks uh, to, uh, to, to be able to run in the container. Uh, so uh, basically the idea is when the program will do a read IO call, uh, then instead of the read IO call, well, there would be a mem copy and it would be reading from uh, the actual chunk. So the actual chunk is being copied over here. Uh, so you copy from the global variable to the read buffer uh, and you update all the IO call variables uh, and, uh, and, and basically the application uses the data from, uh, from, from that uh, buffer. <clears throat> Uh, so we are uh, specifically looking at how this can be helpful for uh, specializing the IO calls in scientific libraries. Some of the scientific libraries, uh, such as NetCDF and HDF5, they have a lot of data, but a few variables uh, uh, that are accessed by, by an application. Uh, so here, for instance, we had a, 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 a larger file, which was about 30 MB, and the application was only accessing the temperature attribute. Uh, so we determined that, well, only 6.6 .6 megabytes from that 30 megabytes uh, were actually used. And we looked at different sizes of the files, and we could determine, hey, what exactly is the amount of data that is being accessed from the temperature attribute. And then one can do, uh, a the application may give a spatial region. And so the, the amount of data that is actually used is is much, uh, much smaller. <clears throat> so that brings us, uh, uh, so, so Midas is still work in progress. Uh, one may say that, well, uh, the inputs, uh, you know, exactly uh, kind of baking the data into an application is, is, is dangerous because what if the application use, uses some other inputs, some other data? And that is part of our uh, sort of uh, the research agenda that we have. Uh, partial evaluation can help us determine uh, other variants uh, given, given these inputs. We can determine uh, some other possibilities that can exist and uh, basically include that much amount of data, uh, but not any data that was never ever touched by, by an application. So uh, allowing for adjustable inputs, especially during sensitivity analysis that one is doing, uh, is is part of what what we are thinking how to improve partial evaluation um, um, so any questions uh, on 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 this part um, we are good okay so uh, uh, this brings me to the final part of uh, this talk uh, so what I have mentioned is uh, technical debt uh, affects the reproducibility of scientific claims. Uh, and what we saw was a, uh, uh, that this process of evaluating scientific claims uh, is itself being rethought. Uh, artifact description and evaluation is becoming part of our conferences. Uh, and we need better reliability. Obviously, authors do submit a lot of uh, uh, file, a lot many files but we need better mechanisms uh, that can give us quick verification, a quick validation that uh, this program would produce uh, the result that is mentioned in the papers. Uh, containers will be a prominent, prominent choice, but their reliability is poor. As we are seeing, dependencies must be specified. They are inefficient to use space-wise, uh, and there are no guarantees that it can provide for execution verification. Uh, and for interactive programs, uh, which SciUnit works very well, uh, I mean, Docker is, is very difficult to work with, uh, uh, with respect to interactive programs. Uh, so these methods of SciUnit and Midas are, are interesting in, in that regard. Uh, I would strongly encourage you guys to submit, use SciUnit for your next paper submission. Uh, we have it downloaded about 850 times. Um, there are eight active contributors to the project. 
pretty much my students, some uh, other students from other uh, groups uh, back uh, in India and uh, over here in the US came across the project and have been contributing. Uh, it's actively used in geoscience applications, uh, disciplines. Uh, we have had it in, in space science, in uh, hydrology, in uh, solid earth. Uh, and uh, yeah, in, in these three disciplines, uh, there have been laboratories in the US which who have used these and uh, actually educated their graduate students to use this as a common tool uh, while they are doing their doing their work. Um, so you can download it from Sayangit.run. If you have any issues, you can email email us. Um, there is a question here that just came in, uh, if, you, if I may. So yeah, yeah. How do you deal with host CPU system dependent system calls, such as AVX 512 intrinsics, NKL presence or absence, etc.? Uh, actually, Osni, can you repeat the question? I, I'm in my office and the train is going, so uh, I couldn't hear that. How, how do you deal with host CPU system dependent system calls, such as AVX 512 intrinsics, MKL presence? or absence, et cetera? Uh, yes, so these are specialized system calls. Uh, we, uh, in, in one of our papers, we document, uh, we, we audit about uh, 55 uh, system calls. These are pretty much the system calls that are uh, in, the, in the Linux kernel distribution uh, that have been uh, documented. And uh, they are for different architectures, they are for, uh, the x86 uh, ABI interface that is there, uh, we, we are only doing it for that specific architecture. If uh, we have to do it for uh, the specific system calls that you're saying, uh, the, the, the question is that we'll have to have developed ptrace which can actually look into this specific system calls and, and then be able to audit. I hope that answers that. Uh, Osni, are we good? Please go on, show. Please go. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so, coming back to the 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 the, uh, you know, uh, is is there a final thought uh, over here? A final sort of summary. Uh, which is, is there a guidance for improving reproducibility? Uh, <clears throat> so I would like to sort of uh, say that, uh, you know, reproducibility is both a process uh, as well as a guarantee. So we, as, as an author, we see it as a process, a process which is of increasingly difficult levels, I would say. You want first the program to run, but once you have gone from these blue and green bars, you want to run it with different input parameters. You might want to change some part of uh, the, the program, or you might just want to make it available, which requires a lot of documentation if you are making it widely uh, available, which is publishability. Uh, so it's a process. It's a process which uh, is, has to be undertaken and it has different levels. So it cannot be say, said that, um, uh, that, uh, you know, reproducibility is only one thing. No, it's, it's, it's at multiple, multiple levels. Uh, and uh, we, we require guarantees on this process at, uh, also guarantees at this, um, uh, uh, for, for this particular process at these different levels. Uh, it cannot be that we just say that an, applica an application is reproducible and that's it. No, it might be that it runs, but it does not produce the same result or it produces a nearby result. So we need different levels of badging as well, which ACM is, is already doing uh, to say, well, we could run the application, we could find all the artifacts, uh, but we could not run it. So it's so a different kinds uh, that, that might, we could change the method uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> so it's both a process and a guarantee. Um, 
uh, what we we need from a technical debt perspective is that we uh, need to identify what are our sources of of irreproducibility so technical debt is uh, you know it's a broad software engineering term we have to identify what part of technical debt applies to the the region of of uh, or, or applies to the area of reproducibility and for that according to me we we have to start from uh, identifying what are our sources of reproducibility and they can be multiple like they can be concurrency hardware it could be that the application is using random uh, um, uh, uh, just using some 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 uh, ran, uh, uh, randomness, uh, which might be dependent on some random library libraries which are providing that pseudo randomness, or it could be application complexity. The way we are seeing having a lot of uh, different kinds of programs that might be uh, based on which an application is composed of, uh, or just the state of the application. What exactly is it doing from one iteration to the other iteration? Or it might not be, the reproducibility might not be because of the application, it could be because of bugs outside uh, the application. <clears throat> um, so what, what can we do uh, over here? Um, well, uh, as, as we've seen, concurrency and hardware are still harder things. They aren't sort of tools which, uh, they, they, are, they are definitely a lot, lot of ideas within deterministic replay and record and replay in, in these areas, but there aren't tools which give you reproducibility easily. Um, uh, with SciUnit, we are seeing that there is, uh, you know, things that can be done with respect to algorithmic randomness. We can identify that your application is using a library which is itself dependent upon uh, accessing the, the RAND system call. Uh, so we can identify things like that. We can identify application complexity, how complex it is. Uh, we can we can also do execution state, determine uh, what is the execution state at different points by doing checkpointing, and that's uh, additions that we are doing to SciUnit that we can capture that state as well. Uh, and by up applying isolation, uh, you know, doing this within the namespaced uh, environment, we are avoiding bugs outside the application. Uh, what is still still remaining is uh, being able to identify reproducibility uh, within uh, irreproducibility that might be coming due to concurrency. Um, the basis for all this is definitely, uh, uh, you know, we, we collect as much of data as, as possible. Uh, metadata, provenance, the snapshots. Uh, that's very important that we collect the snapshots because unless we have the content, uh, we cannot replay it exactly. We do not know that uh, it is exactly matching to the previous uh, state. Uh, and finally, we need uh, methods for analyzing the, the, the metadata. So uh, I, I think that uh, we, the for improving reproducibility, we need a system which can, uh, which allow, gives us this ability to provide us isolation to begin with. But after isolation, it has the necessary amount of metadata which can be analyzed and uh, some kind of guarantee can be given uh, which can lead to a badging or, 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 or wider claim for, for reproducibility. Uh, so I would like to end over here. I would like to acknowledge uh, the students and research engineers uh, who have uh, worked with me, the postdoc, uh, Hai, who, who worked uh, with me uh, on, this, on this project, um, and, um, and acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, they have been very helpful in giving us use cases as well as uh, in helping us tell us that what is the right interface uh, from which a student, uh, with which students as well as experienced researchers can feel comfortable with uh, uh, in in uh, learning about reproducibility. Uh, and finally, uh, my um, funders, uh, National Science Foundation, uh, the BSSW program, um, the Bloomberg Foundation, NASA, and and DePaul. <clears throat> so with that, I open for questions. Thank you, Tanya. We have a, a couple of questions here. Perhaps, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, how does SciUnit handle interfacing with fabric libraries, verbs, on various machines for MPI applications, which are typically installed and managed by the system 
by the site system systems administrators. So uh, Cyunet uh, works in the user space. Uh, it, uh, if your application is using it, uh, then uh, it would be able to identify that library and 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 be able and and would be able to copy it. Um, so it doesn't require any root permissions uh, over here. Uh, as long as your application, if your application can run successfully, uh, Cyunet can also uh, uh, will will also capture those those dependencies. Another question here: Singularity MPI applications can scale to hundreds or thousands of nodes at near the same time as bare metal. Can one do the same with an MPI application that's packaged with a Cyunet? Yeah, that's uh, uh, an experiment that we still have. I I cannot. Uh, I don't see why it wouldn't be able to do it, but uh, that is still an experiment that uh, that we have to do to show that scalability. Okay, Anshu, I think that's uh, uh, Tanu. Sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, Tanu. I think this is the last question we had. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to share my screen here to uh, announce the next um, webinar in our I can uh, sharing series. Yes. Um, so thank you all again for participating. Uh, we wanted to improve the series. So Please feel free uh, to give us feedback. There is this survey uh, that we have put together. These slides and the record will be available at these two sites uh, um, next week uh, or early next week. And the next webinar in this series is going to be on December the 9th, uh, it's the last one in uh, 2020, software design for longevity with a performance portability. And it's going to be presented by Anshu uh, Dubey from Argo National Laboratory in the University of Chicago. And uh, we have already uh, uh, a web page for it, and people can already sign, sign, sign up for this webinar. So thank you all again for participating. Uh, Ashley, would you have some final remarks? Thank you, Tanu. Thanks yeah. so much, uh, Osni. Yes. Yep, that's all I was going to say is thank you to Tanu and um, great talk. And I hope everyone has a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.